The reading is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 3 verses 1 to 10. In those days when the boy Samuel was serving the Lord under the direction of Eli, there were very few messages from the Lord and visions from him were quite rare. One night, Eli, who was now almost blind, was sleeping in his own room. Samuel was sleeping in the sanctuary where the sacred covenant box was. Before dawn, while the lamp was still burning, the Lord called Samuel He answered, Yes, sir, and ran to Eli and said, You called me, and here I am. But Eli answered, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord called Samuel again. The boy did not know that it was the Lord, because the Lord had never spoken to him before. So he got up, went to Eli, and said, You called me, and here I am. But Eli answered, My son, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. The Lord called Samuel a third time. He got up, went to Eli and said, You called me and here I am. Then Eli realised that it was the Lord who was calling the boy. So he said to him, Go back to bed and if he calls you again, say, Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. So Samuel went back to bed. The Lord came and stood there and called as he had before, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, Speak, your servant is listening. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The reading comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, starting at verse 43. Jesus calls Philip and Nathanael. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Come with me. Philip was from Bethsaida, the town where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We have found the one whom Moses wrote about in the book of the law and whom the prophets also wrote about. He is Jesus, son of Joseph, from Nazareth. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Nathanael asked. Come and see, answered Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, he said about him, Here is a real Israelite. There is nothing false in him. Nathanael asked him, How do you know me? Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip called you. Teacher, answered Nathanael. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus said, Do you believe just because I told you I saw you when you were under a fig tree? You will see much greater things than this. And he said to them, I am telling you the truth. You will see heaven open and God's angels going up and coming down on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. of Orient are, and if it have us afar, fill the fountain more and mountain, following on the star. Oh, 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. So in our Old Testament text today, we see Samuel living in a precarious time when the word of the Lord was rare, as it says in verse 1. This situation continues the problem from the end of Judges where all the people did what was right in their own eyes, it says in Judges 21, 25. And indeed, 1 Samuel 2 speaks of how Eli's sons did what was right in their own eyes in their work as priests, 1 Samuel 2. Um, and if we read on in today's reading past verse 10, we see the outcome of that, really, the difficult message which young Samuel has to tell Eli, very hard for him as a, a young boy to transmit such a difficult message to his elder and his guide, uh, basically saying what will happen as a result of these sins. The times are as dark as the night that falls at the beginning of the story, and I think the same could be said of the times we're in now. So what can we learn from this story and then from our story in John of Nathaniel and Philip? That passage, appropriately for Epiphany Tide, speaks of the revelation of Jesus to Israel and the world. And we get a hint of the glory of Jesus later to be revealed in the resurrection when Nathanael is told he will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. That's um, 151, the last verse of our reading today. That image, of course, is, is resonant from uh, uh, of the Old Testament image of Jacob's vision of the ladder between earth and heaven. And we can see that being fulfilled in Jesus. But of course, before that, before that wonderful revelation, um, then uh, Nathaniel nearly dismisses the whole thing out of hand because of his prejudice against Nazareth. And indeed, in a, in a similar way, people unfamiliar with it may look at the institution of the church or Christianity and Christians with similarly sceptical and prejudiced eyes. One of the issues I think that can be a barrier uh, is that people expect us as Christians and churchgoers to be perfect. But this side of the second coming, it is impossible for us to be so. We live in a fallen world, of course, I hope that we will all strive to be as Christ-like and holy as we can. But if we're honest, how many of us fall short at times, especially if, like Eli, we have to choose between God and our family? I think the contrast between Samuel's mother, Hannah, and Eli is interesting. If you remember that story, um, Eli judges her when she comes to the temple and remember she's she's barren and she's desperately praying for a child he assumes her to be a drunk but who in the end is holier she is prepared to give up that child that she's so long for when he's so tiny probably as young as three and to give him into the care of the temple in order to fulfill her promise to God. In contrast, Eli knows full well that his sons are doing wrong and that actually their sins are particularly bad because they are priests, so they're you know, held to a higher account. And in the end, who had to take on the fatherly role of the necessary disciplinary actions that Eli wouldn't? God did. Who is the more loving father in reality? Who is the holier person between Eli and and Hannah. Hannah, a woman who would have been really derided and despised in that culture for her barrenness, let alone being thought of as a drunk. And yet, despite his flaws, we see in this passage today that Eli still knows God and he guides and he helps Hannah. And then God still allows him to teach and guide Samuel, who was eventually to become Israel's greatest judge. For it is Eli, as we can see in this uh, reading, who really spots who is calling Samuel and opens his mind to the possibility that God is the one calling him. He instructs and he guides him. Then, even though he may suspect the hardness of God's message to him that's coming, Eli understands that the right thing to do is to encourage Samuel to face his fears and to be absolutely honest in what he says, even though the message will be a hard one to transmit and for Eli to hear. 
So both texts, I think, teach us something about the danger of being blinded by our preconceptions. In John, we hear how Nathaniel is ready to give up on the whole thing when he hears where Jesus comes from, the famous can anything good come out of Nazareth line, which I'm sure would have raised laughter in some circles and anger in others at the time. Uh, in the story of Samuel, as we've alluded already, we remember when he first sees Samuel's mother, um, Eli first sees Samuel's mother, Hannah, he mistakes her passionate and fervent praying for drunkenness. Uh, that's also happens at Pentecost, doesn't it? But he soon realises his mistake. The boy in the temple, Samuel, is there just because of that encounter. So God often acts in a way which surprises people and appears uh, in unexpected people and places. Why would God choose a baby to be the saviour of the world? Or boys like David or Samuel to be great leaders? Or disgraced women like Hannah or Mary for that matter? Or aliens or outcasts? Or somebody that comes from Nazareth? Let's have our eyes and ears open for who God might be calling now. Might it even be you? We also learn from these passages that if we don't yet know Christ, or if we just want to continue to grow and learn, we need to be prepared to look for and listen out for God speaking, sometimes directly, sometimes through scripture, and sometimes through other people. We can allow ourselves, even when we feel sceptical, to be guided by others who have more experience in the faith, as Samuel did when he was guided by Eli, or Nathaniel did when Philip urged him to just come and see. There must have been something about Philip which was appealing enough to transcend Nathaniel's prejudices. And we know that once people get to know Jesus, then he'll do the rest. So let's try to cultivate that spirit in ourselves. How can we make our light shine to guide others on the right path in these dark times? I think those of us who call ourselves Christians have a duty to try to guide others in the faith, just as Eli does for Samuel. And God can still use us despite our flaws. We might think we're not good enough or learned enough, or we don't know enough or whatever, but God can still use us. We might be the, one of those people who's called to be just enthusiastic and persuasive and, and kind of winning like Philip to encourage those around us who are wary and sceptical in case they're the very person that God's calling. We need to encourage them to be listening out for him, even if they don't really know who he is. A personal relationship with someone who does know God is a key to so many people for helping with this. And this gives us all a challenge and an opportunity. And actually, I think that not being able to say to people, come to church at the moment might actually be a huge opportunity for us all because sometimes inviting someone to church can sort of translate itself as we'll come along and belong to my nice friendly social club and that's all I have to do but if they've come because of your invitation then you like Philip with Nathaniel or Eli with Samuel are best placed to guide them on their journey to knowing Jesus so I think this closure of our buildings gives us a real opportunity to talk to our friends and family and our work colleagues even about our faith if we are still at work. All those phone calls, Teams or Zooms or Skypes or FaceTimes, all those virtual get-togethers, they give us a chance to share more deeply about what we believe in. As one commentator said, if we are convinced that Christian faith holds the truth about human life, then we must, in all earnestness, show people how that truth makes sense and is embodied in our own lives, both as individuals and as communities. And indeed, for many of us, it might have been the example of our parents or other family members or friends who, in their own lives, presented a coherent witness to the faith that convinced us of the truth of the Christian faith. John reminds us today that it's not only marvellous signs that lead to faith. Jesus prayed that his disciples might be one so that the world might believe, 1721. Thus, faith comes about when people see, witness, people see communities, families, churches, and even larger communities living out in unity the truth of the gospel 
and offering people a coherent vision for life. Wherever we are, we have the chance to share this vision. So let's do it. And again, I remind you that if you're watching or listening, thinking you're not good enough, you don't know enough to hear God or to be used by him, then I hope that today's examples might demonstrate that God can and does use anyone he chooses. We just have to say, here I am, Lord, and be prepared to listen and to learn and not to be afraid to speak the truth. And then God will equip us. He'll give us what we need. So let's not let our preconceptions blind us to God's truth and the real transforming presence of Christ who changes everything. God chooses to come through the humble, the despised, the lowly, what two famous commentators on the Gospel of John call the offence of the incarnation. Who's God calling today who we might be dismissing or who might be dismissive of us and our faith, but to whom we can say, come and see? Who can we lead to the gospel truth through our words and actions? This might not always be easy, but it is immensely worthwhile and it is life changing. God's call often involves working to change human systems that are broken, leading down difficult paths. But he'll help us with that too. God's call sometimes comes when we least expect it and often to those we least expect. He is a God of surprises. So we as the church need to be like Eli, encouraging everyone to hear the voice that calls them forth into who they're created to be. At the same time, we need to help each other to tell the truth, even when that's hard to hear. So we've got an opportunity, especially those who've got more time on our hands, to use it to be encouragers and guides. Even those who are on the front lines, who are exhausted, overworked, afraid, you too can show the love of God through your words and deeds to those around you. I think every single one of us can be a light in the darkness, however small, to show people the way. For Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So let's help more people to find him. Let's say today, here I am, Lord. I'm listening. Send me. Amen.